Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm Deanne. And I'm Philippe. And welcome to our Lime in the Book Club. We are reading Checkmate by Dorothy Dunnett. And today we are going to talk about part two, chapters five, six, and seven. I will lead the discussion, but before we dive into the chapters, initial reactions, Dee and Philippe, that you want to share. Oh, this is a good set of chapters. I'm so intrigued about what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad to talk about them. I think this is a good, a good set to talk about. Um, I spent a large portion of the reading trying to figure out how much of this was pre-planned by Lyman or how much he just came up with it on the fly. And when we get to it in our discussion, I'd love your opinions as well. So. Yes. Yes. Interesting. And uh, I was wrong yet again. Laura, you asked in our last video, or maybe it was D. I forget who asked whether we thought Lyman was still suicidal. I was like, oh no, he's over that. I thought it was really funny that you brought that up like right before the reveal that he tried to kill himself. <laughs> yeah. And can I just say I love Archie? Yeah. Never suspected him for a second. <laughs> like, yeah. I love that scene though, where like Adam and, and Jared are both like, it's okay, you know, and we Adam's like, it's okay, Jared. Danny obviously means well. He just right. doesn't know Archie like we do, but no one is actually suspicious of Archie except right. Danny. Right. And I actually kind of like that Danny is paying so much attention to Lyman that he suspects Archie, even though he wasn't actually paying attention to the right things. But I still like that. Yeah, like actually that um, both Archie and Danny in that moment where Lyman tries to kill himself um, are both there to watch over Lyman. And it's just right. Danny misinterprets because he doesn't know Archie the way the other ones do. Yeah, exactly. Um, that means Archie was the one who wrote the letter, right? Or no, was that still someone else? Huh? Oh no, I have a theory about that. Okay, because I was like, I don't think that was Archie because that means Lyman got captured, so. No, 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 I don't think it was Archie. But we still don't know who wrote the letter. I think it was Lyman. Well, that's what, that's the thing. Like, I don't know how much was pre-planned and how much wasn't. Yeah. So. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it was Lyman. And I think that's one of the reasons he's so mad that the old lady died, because that wasn't part of the plan, that, that he was trying to get captured to do this whole fake thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I'm crediting him with too much three-dimensional chess, but yeah. I think it was Lyman. Anyway, uh, I could I, be completely wrong. Right. I don't think it was Lyman. Oh, okay. Well, Probably like, know who it was. Maybe I just want it to be Lyman because I don't want someone to betray him. And I want him to be, I don't know. I like the idea of a really elaborate plot. But. I mean, I think what's, um, well, I guess we'll have to dive into it when we, when we look at the text, but I think in that scene, Lyman is so discombobulated um, that it's more like he doesn't catch on that it's a trap rather than that he knows oh. and is manipulating it. Yeah, I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was him until, until he started going along with Gray so much. Um, Lord Grey, and then I was like, wait a second, maybe this whole thing is planned from the beginning, and but who knows? And it would seem like doing a high risk plan where he might die seems somewhat in character for this point. Of, like, he's like, well, they might kill me. Oh, well, you know, that is certainly true. Yes, yeah. that, that's always been his MO, but yeah, in particular now. Yeah. Um, I think also I really enjoyed the um, the buildup of tension in the sequence where he goes to visit um, uh, whatever her name is, old lady, um, because Renee. Like, yeah, Renee Jorda, because you know, like there's all these little hints, you know, like the birds flying, mm -hmm. um, and the way that like she doesn't have a lot of food, but she refers to these rough men that have been bringing her food. Mm -hmm. Nice, but they're a little rough, and you're like, mm. and then like. Oh. So, and just the fact that she's there, like all the other, all the other farms are abandoned, but she's there. Like that was super suspicious. Yeah. And then the way that like, she doesn't have the, uh, that much food, but she has plenty of firewood 
And like, as soon as I read that, I remember the first time I read it, I was like, this is a trap, the fire is a signal. Um, and Lyman is so distracted by the, the headache and the stress of the family stuff that he's missing yeah. these really obvious signs. This is one of the only times the reader is ahead of Lyman. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I guess that's why I thought it was all his plan because I'm not used to being ahead of Lyman. <laughs> like I, I just assumed that it was, that it was, he was doing some sort of shenanigans because that's what's always happening, so. Yeah, you know, there's even there's a line in there about how he's doing something to distract himself and basically because it takes all his attention because he's just mm. like, he's so he's just such a mess. He's such a mess in these three chapters in particular, more so than like ever. Yeah, I also really love just the story of him and um, Strazi like getting their <laughs> just getting their intelligence you know and then like faking selling the apples and going in and like totally pulling the wool over everyone's eyes and figuring out all this stuff like that was just a delightful caper <laughs> yeah I love that we have that balance of like before we get to all the dark heavy stuff we have the the comedy and like the two of them in a buddy comedy is <laughs> like yeah what? yeah it's, it is it's just like a buddy road trip with sort of like a caper at the end <laughs> which was fun 100 percent. all right should we dive in okay by the way i found all my the chart i made of all the birthdays and death and everything but we can talk about it when we get to the part where the old lady's telling him more information it was actually in checkmate it wasn't in green castle <laughs> uh yeah and when i said oh i think we know that his grandpa died when he was a toddler we didn't know that because you find out in here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right here right. I was like, I made more of that. I was like, oh, that's what we were looking for last time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so we have Lyman coming back to find Jarrett on a bender, um, sobers <laughs> him up. Turns out that Jarrett had had a fight with Marta because she had a whole bunch of artists and musicians come over and he disapproved and she didn't want him there. And basically she had kicked him out. Um, love that he gets mad at her but <laughs> the end result is that Jarrett gets kicked out and goes on a bender as opposed to anything happening to Marta she's just like get out of my house um yeah their relationship is is highly entertaining and and you know it's like it's funny because like I have more I relate more to Marta and I have more sympathy with her but I also have like a lot of sympathy with Jarrett it's like they just they both could have a good relationship where they benefit each other if they could just like connect yeah. but they just they keep hitting these walls yeah yeah if they um, could just like have a single conversation where they lay everything out on the table it, both of them like you'd think they could actually work together well but yeah i mean he's got such a big heart and yeah. she needs that and, and he you know he just he's so judgmental yeah like if he could just get over that he really does care about her you know yeah. and he's such an idiot and she's so smart like if he just if she just let his big heart like be part of the relationship and then if he just let her like make all those decisions <laughs> like they would be a powerhouse <laughs> exactly and like they kind of almost got there at the end of pawn and then that, but that was like the only time it happened yeah. i love how there's not a single person that actually sympathizes with him except for a tiny bit of Danny has slipped, and that's probably just because he's thirsty for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, Adam and, and Lyman are both more on the art side of things and like supportive to Marta for that reason. And Lyman's like, I can't be his nursemaid anymore. Yeah. Um, okay, so then the Duke de Guise and Piero Strozzi return, um, and we have these indications of the rivalry between de Guise and Lyman where de Guise needs to build up his reputation and so he needs to get Lyman out of the way and take credit for stuff Lyman's done yeah. um and then we have this big reveal that Lyman has proposed that the French take back Calais from the English um so we can talk about that I think um how much is this like Lyman trying to help the strategy of the French and how much of this is Lyman just needing an excuse to go find Rene Jorda mm -hmm. um but Either way, we end up with Lyman um, basically talking Piero Strozzi into taking him on a mission to uh, spy for the attack, uh, to plan the attack on Calais. Um, 
And then as they go off on their buddy comedy adventures, we do have some talk about sort of the philosophy of war, which is where we get the reveal that Lyman's grandfather was um, someone who was heavily involved in war, like a, a, a fighter um, who died when Lyman was three. Um, Strozzi says he fought his whole life for love of war um, and that he, it's sort of in the context of Strozzi saying that Lyman doesn't love war. Um, so it's sort of an interesting thing that we can kind of dive into. Um, and then they end up talking about why Lyman wants to go back to Russia and he says to enforce peace and to rule. So mm -hmm. not to fight, but to peace, rule, I don't know. Um, so then they have their little adventure. They disguise themselves as apple sellers, they spy. Um, and then at the end, um, Lyman writes down everything he observed and splits off from Strozzi to go find Rene Jorda. Did Leone Strozzi die off book? Or did he just die in that recent attack? Because they do mention that Leone is dead now. Mm -hmm. I think we were told when he died. I think okay, because I missed that, I guess. He was in Palm? I don't remember. Yeah, I think it was a while ago. Yeah. I think we were told, though, because I don't think it was like an off screen thing. I think it was mm -hmm. like, oh, that happened. Yeah. I think I vaguely remember thinking, oh, I guess he's not coming back because he died. Yeah, but don't worry, there's two Strozzi's. Yeah. Which, Piero was the one that sort of was the pirate as well, right? Or was that Leone? I think that was Leone. I've been confused. I think that was Leone because Leone was the knight of, no wait, Ugh, I don't know. He was the one that tried to also take over. He was in the running to be the grandmaster of the knights. Yeah, also. Leone was. Yes, yeah. but it never happened because- right. His interests were too. They were too. I guess Florence or something. Yeah, oh, I remember he dies in pawn because there's a whole thing with him where he takes the papers that implicate Gabriel back to Malta, um, and they don't work. Right. Because he has an ulterior motive that everyone knows, which is to become Grandmaster himself. And then right. they have that battle where his nephew, I think, is killed. Um, and then he dies somewhere around that. Okay. Yeah. I forget all that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so thoughts on this budding conflict with the Duke de Guise and where that's gonna go? I mean, it's, I think it's interesting. It gives this level of because sort of up to now, Lyman's been super competent with the French and the French king is really grateful. And like, it seems like, oh, he's got a lot of power and isn't that nice. And it seems like things are sort of going well with the French power structure. But I think this is going to add a really interesting like wrinkle to the whole thing because the better Lyman comes off, the worse it is for the Duc de Guise. And he has a lot of power and he doesn't want to lose that power. And so he's going to be doing everything he can to sort of push Lyman down. So, and he needs to take credit for all the stuff that Lyman did. I, I love the bit about um, uh, he discover he comes back and discovers uh, a defensible Lyon, a tranquil court and a confident and liberated Paris that by some perverse fortune, France had been rescued without him, which is, bad for him. So um, yeah, so I just think that adds a nice bit of tension in the power structure. So it's interesting to like kind of imagine yourself in that position of power of like the king or or you know someone very high up and wanting these powerful people all working for you to further your ends, but also having to be aware that they're all in competition with each other and could be undercutting each other. Um, it's, it's just really interesting. Like you can't, you can't ever trust that they're all out for your own good because they're going to do what they need to do to undercut each other. And how can you tell apart when someone really betrayed you versus got betrayed by a rival? Yeah. Yeah. And obviously it's best for the King and France if both Diggies and Lyman are working in concert with each other and like, you know, supporting each other and, and using their brains to egg each other on to hire whatever. Um, but that's not what happens in real life, so. 
Yeah. yeah, although it's cool that Lyman and Strozzi, even though they have plenty of reason to be at odds, since Strozzi is the one that captured him at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, they seem to like like and get along well and, and work together effectively, at least so far. They sort of have a little bit of a um, Dickon-like relationship, you know, with with Lyman, sort of it, like they respect each other and, you know, they have, they don't have a, Lyman's not head and shoulders above Strosi and vice versa. And, yeah, I think they do have somewhat of a, a relationship of like military equals, but I think Lyman takes him with a big grain of salt as kind of like a funny character, you know? Right, well, and, and Lyman's not interested in what he knows the way that he was with Dickon. Like it, yeah. it's not the exploring and, you know, adventurer kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, actually it's interesting because I think Lyman looked up to Dickon Chancellor, he was doing something that Lyman really, really valued, the exploration right. and discovery, whereas you yeah. have that whole conversation about war and how Lyman looks down on war, so he's he's not, he doesn't look up to Strozzi like that. Yeah. You also see that he's willing to sort of share his glory or whatever, his his victories with Strozzi, because he gives him all that information and basically says, Calais is up to you, like, I've got other things to do. Go do it. No. See, that's sort of where I wonder, like, does he care, does he really care about Kelly, how much does he care versus mm -hmm. is the whole thing just a reason for him to be able to sneak off and go see Rene Jorda? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost two birds with one stone. It's it's both helping France and helping him accomplish his personal goals. I mean, I think an interesting question is also like, how much does he actually care about France? And, you know, the French, does he really care that the king of France is in charge of this part of the land or the king of Spain is in charge of this part of the land or, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, does he really, how much does he care about? I mean, he may care a little bit, but I'm not sure that he's passionately invested in the French court remaining in power. No. I still think his heart lies in Scotland, even though he wants to go back to Russia. I think he's partly doing it because helping France help Scotland, especially if this specific attack is against England, because hurting England also helps Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the tension in this is really interesting and built up because we don't know exactly what's going on in Lyman's head. He has every reason to betray France. They basically have kidnapped him and are holding him hostage by forcing his, his, mar his divorce to be delayed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and are forcing him to fight for them. And, you know, he, he refers to the golden chains that they're holding him with. So he, I mean, it wouldn't be unimaginable for him to actually betray them. But yeah. at the same time, he's given his word saying he, he will fight for them for 12 months. So would he betray that word? Question. Yeah. I was a little, I was a little nervous that he had betrayed them. Like when I was reading that scene, I was, I didn't think he would, like, it didn't seem like a Lyman thing to do. But at the same time, I was kind of like, well, if he's really mad at France for, for keeping him, like maybe he would. And so he wants to go back to Russia. Yeah, I was really reading that pretty closely. One thing I do think before we skip on from the De Guise thing, I thought Lyman makes a statement that I thought was a little ominous um, where he says at the bottom of 194 and top of 195, he says, um, in any case, I deserve more confidence. Um, I do protest then that you are showing than than you are showing in me in performance and in humility. I'm quite exemplary. The Duke cannot break me. And this was in response to Strozzi saying that the Duke um, that the Duke uh, breaks that he breaks them and they do not survive the experience. His rival he breaks his rivals and they don't survive. And so Lyman says, the Duke cannot break me. And there's a little bit of me that goes, ooh, that foreshadowing's not good. <laughs> like like when, it, when someone says, absolutely, this cannot happen, I'm just like, mm, maybe that's going to happen. So, so I don't know, but it just seemed a little ominous that he's so confident in his ability to withstand the Duke. So... Um. Well, and then we have him later being confident in his ability to survive torture um, and to yeah. give information that is false. So 
On the yeah. other hand, this is Lyman, and he's really good at things like that. So he has survived torture in the past. So um, also, I loved this quote at the, in the mid of 196. Not necessarily for the story, just in general. I loved it. It was so beautiful. Where he says, um, "But the days are evil. Iniquity aboundeth, and charity waxeth cold." I was just like, "Oh, I feel like that applies to today." The days are evil, iniquity aboundeth, and charity waxeth cold. I'm sure that's a quote from something. Yeah, that was sad. I'll Google it at some point. Yeah. Maybe it's a quote from Dunnett. I think the TH is to reveal that it must be a quote. Mm -hmm. Surely. Um, I also kind of enjoyed, they're talking about, um, you know, what Lyman can do to improve his position and Strozzi tells him he should marry Catherine Dalban. Well, it says get a get a bash child on her and then she'll have to marry you quickly. Yeah, get her um, pregnant. And then he's like, yeah, I'll be safe as long as her dad doesn't realize I slept with her mom. <laughs> that was good. Um, but then he also then, you know, then they talk about how Mary Queen of Scots wants him to stay with Philippa and he basically makes a comment that like is basically like the equivalent of it's too bad I can't clone myself. Yeah, I can't trip, have myself in triplicate. <laughs> yeah, it would be convenient if one could be reproduced in triplicate to satisfy every party. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Um, so then there, this is where um, they go off on their adventure. Um, and I think the conversation here is really interesting in terms of insight into what Lyman is doing with his life and how he feels about it. Just mm -hmm. because I feel like there's always been this tension where he, remember he in Disorderly Nights where he's talking to Jared about what he really wants to be spending his time doing. And Jared's like, you love this whole building an army thing. And, and Lyman says he hates it and he misses good conversation and art and music and talking to women. Um, and so th this sort of like echoes that where um, they're talking about war um, and Strozzi tells him, um, so the fish dislikes water. You have about you a stink of Malta. Like this idea that he's really good at all this fighting stuff, but he, Strozzi's very insightful and picks up that Lyman doesn't actually enjoy this. Yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, do you spit on your grandfather who fought all his life in France and in Italy for love of war in Albany? Yeah. And then we get that. I remember his funeral. I was three years old at the time. We also get the reveal that uh, his grandfather had a, a terrible scar that destroyed his beauty. Mm -hmm. And he, so had that. he had that. He had some sort of major injury at some point. And he had that very familial blonde hair. Mm -hmm. or he had cornflower blue eyes. I am more and more convinced that his grandfather is actually his father because why does he keep coming up? Like, here's my, the reason I'm suspicious of this is because he keeps getting mentioned like random little sentences about, oh, your grandfather, this, your grandfather, that. And then like, even when we get to the nurse lady, we can talk about it more, but like she mentions like, and he met your, like he met your grandfather met, um, or no, it says not your grandfather. He says your father, like the man, Mr. X met, Sibylla at the convent but now we just learned that his grandfather has been in France and Italy like his whole this whole time and spends all this time in war and so I'm like mm. so suspicious so suspicious so suspicious because otherwise why bring him up he's not a character in the story right he's not he's not someone that we care about unless he actually impacts directly what's going on so what do you think about um, Lyman and what this tells us about him as a character in terms of the fish just likes water and what he says about Russia to enforce peace and then to rule? Well, I don't think it tells us anything new. Like I think this is this is the this is the the characterization of Lyman that I think we've seen multiple times in the story that he's very very skilled at war but he doesn't like it it's not and he's kind of resigned in some ways to doing a thing he's good at 
but that his ultimate goal is to benefit people wherever he is instead of, I don't know. The terms um, enforce peace and to rule, the, the connotations of the words she uses to describe these things are not fully positive mm -hmm. connotations. Enforce peace and rule. Yeah. Those easily could be dark things that someone does maybe with a good intention, but also with a, you know, dominating negative connotation as well. I think he's kind of gotten more cynical. Like that's a very cynical thing to say that you have to enforce peace and to rule. I had this slight thought of, I wonder what would have happened to Russia if Lyman had actually taken over in the 1500s. Like what, the, what would that have done to Russia? Well, what would have happened to Lyman's soul? Would he really have like how much of it would he have kept and, and would he really have been able to make a difference in Russia or would he have just ended up so corrupted that the changes he made didn't really make that big of a difference after all? Um, because I think also just this is reminiscent of that speech in Disorderly Nights, but in Disorderly Nights, it wasn't, I miss ruling. It was, I miss conversation and music. Yeah. You know, like, is this really, I mean, it kind of goes back to the whole Russia thing as a red herring in terms of what Lyman really wants to be doing with his life. Yeah. Well, also, I wonder if it's a little bit of he's settling. Like, even this is still an outshoot of what he's good at versus what he wants. Like, if what he really wants is to settle down somewhere with Philippa and play music and have some kids, you know, or whatever. Like if that's, if that's what his heart really wants and have good conversation and read good books and, you know, sponsor explorers who come back and tell him about the world or whatever, but he can't have that. And he knows he can't have it or he thinks he can't have it. And so second choice is, well, I guess I'll, do as good much good as I can in this way that I'm skilled at even though I kind of hate it you know if that's well and I think the other thing with Russia that we now that we have the reveal that he's still very much suicidal is mm -hmm. that Russia is just as much a way of taking himself off the playing board and and like it's such a high risk thing to do that it's like almost suicide but you know he can sort of tell himself that it's not that he has a chance yeah yeah the risk is high and the reward is high if he wins but mostly the risk is just high yeah um so that was the heavy part and then they have the um the fun which i, I quite enjoy um uh the king's trusted commanders took a fancy it seemed to put the whole enterprise to risk for the sake of an hour's entertainment. Um, Lyman rendered even the greatest practical joker in Italy speechless with combined hysteria and anxiety. Um, and then we have the reveal that he's sort of getting his revenge on Strozzi for capturing mm -hmm. him in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of wonder if he's like making him slog through like <laughs> bad terrain or something, you know? <laughs> Well, and but he's pulling these. I mean, we don't get any details on whatever these stunts are, really. But he's doing he's pulling these stunts that are so dangerous that he's even scaring Strozzi. And you have to assume he's doing it with some degree of uh, security that it's going to work out okay because he really doesn't want to risk Strozzi. But mm -hmm. um, but he's also like it's kind of scaring the crap out of him for fun, <laughs> for yeah. fun slash vengeance. He's also in complete control. Like you know, with the entire plot here is driven by what's going on in Francis's head and like how to go forth about the spying and like the acting that's happening, like Strozzi's sort of just sitting in the back with his mouth shut because he doesn't want to mess anything up, but, but I well, mean, he, really he gets to be the uncle. <laughs> and presumably Strozzi can't pull off the uh, like Cockney accent or whatever that he has. Right, right. Yeah, I, I love this whole acting with the apples and the night porter and the like it's just so funny and and it's fun to see him like the competent actor pulling the wool over everyone's eyes kind of thing 
acting like he gets super drunk so he can get all the information out of Pigeot or Pigot, whatever his name is, the guy in the bar who basically tells him, oh, you want to, here's all the things, <laughs> here's how you do it. Yeah, let's just tell us all, tell you all about the defenses and the sluice gates and how to flood everything. <laughs> and here you go. Oh, and just the way they get in past the guards and they turn it around where they're like totally getting their asses kicked and then they turn it around into like being able to sell the apples for a good price and being welcomed in. Right, right. So fun. I love that, like, I feel like this is definitely, I, I you know, she's like done it as writing the final book of the series and she's like, what are the things that people love about this or that I love about these characters? Mm -hmm. and like, how do I fit as much in as possible? So we have so much of Lyman acting and in disguise and, and pulling these cool, fun stunts off. Yeah. Um, so when they talk afterward, I thought it was interesting. There's a, there's a reference to um, Sir Henry Palmer, I guess was the guard guy. Mm -hmm. And then um, the Lyman says, yes, I knew Tommy, the older brother. Um, and that guy, Thomas Palmer, was the one that Will Scott played Taroko with at the end of Game of Kings. Oh, I knew we knew who he was, but I couldn't remember. Yeah, I was trying to figure out who Henry Palmer was. I was like, that's a name we've heard, wasn't it? Yeah, I feel Henry like, Palmer. I think they were both in Game of Kings. I can't remember anymore, but it was like one of them was captured and then the other, I don't know. Yeah. But there was a whole thing about the person that Will Scott learned to play Taroko from was the one that like had been taught by one of them. Mm, okay. Um, I did like this whole conversation where it, after the Apple thing, um, Strozzi and Lyman start talking about, like Strozzi starts asking him about the political situation in Scotland and especially about religion. And Strozzi basically says um, like, he's motivated by revenge for his father and, and all of this. And then, and Lyman says, um, I too stand on neither side, but not, I think without a God, if I went back, I should have to choose. And Strozzi gives this whole sort of like practical thing about like, well, you should choose and that's not a bad thing. And here's why, and, and kind of does this whole political thing. Um, you may have to choose between your God and your country, or you may have to choose differently from your family who wish you to come back. Is this what you fear? Part of it, Lyman said, it's all rather more complex than you imagine. <laughs> like, that's true. Okay. But just at this, um, it's sort of, it looks like we're at the beginning of religion and politics becoming, like starting to become a little bit divorced like they're so entwined here but it's you know now if you look at England like most people are completely secular like there's not there's not that devotion to religion anymore and so we're starting to get this modern age come interesting well yeah Strutzi says um politics and religion are no longer fingers on the same hand yeah um so. I think also it's interesting because she's done it as foreshadowing and setting up the religious wars that are coming the, the catholic between the catholics and the protestants right um and we were sort of wondering before like why was the escape sequence from a calvinist gathering rather than from like a general war related thing um and i think it's all she's planting these seeds because this is about to be what blows up right. not only in france but in scotland and england as well um, yeah yeah, Strozzi's comment is really foreshadowing, but it's foreshadowing the far future, not the near future, because there's still a couple hundred years of, <laughs> of religion and politics and fighting. And there's going to be well, some turmoil to get to yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. Just a wee bit. Yeah. And I mean, it's still there in some places, for sure. I also love the little reference back to Nicholas de Nicolay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a De Nicolay and a Chancellor. Yeah. So about who taught Lyman to make maps and Strozzi learned it from Nicholas De Nicolay, or, mm -hmm. or at least was referring to him. And then Lyman says, I was taught by an Englishman, which must be Chancellor. Yeah. Throwbacks to the old books. Yeah, there's so many. Um, also, Strozzi's father's name is Philippe. I just wanted to point that out. Oh. 
Maybe a, a far distant relative. I mean, I am French. Well, there well, the you go. Nazis are Italian. I think they're Italian, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, um, there, never mind. Yeah. Oh, and then we get Danny and the six guys. And as soon as I read the end of this chapter where it says, um, uh, Strozzi, that uh, he did not give a wide berth to Peron. Instead, he recruited six men, including Danny Hislop, and set out to track down this imp imprudent late fellow traveler. I was just like, oh no, it's another instance where Lyman doesn't tell people what he's doing. And then the people who try to help him are actually thwarting his plan. And it's like, ah, oh. but in this case, they do actually, they do actually kind of help him. So. No, they, they don't though. They don't make any difference. He's but they make a difference later if they if it's if this isn't his whole plan, they do rescue him. They do rescue him later. Yes. Even and though he's mad about it. But yes, they do rescue him later. Yeah. There's a lot of them thwarting his plans. So yes. Uh, then he came back to France to begin with. This is what um, any other thoughts on chapter five before we move on to six? No. All right, so chapter six is where Lyman goes off on his own into the war zone to find Rene Jorda, um, who we have just learned about has been Sibylla's servant during her youth. And so we'll have potential inside info about uh, the mystery man. Um, he finds her alone on an abandoned farm and she is elderly and blind. She recognizes him as Francis Crawford she reveals that the Spanish soldiers have been looking after her. Um, she gets Lyman to set a fire, which he does. Um, and then she uh, gives a number of revelations that I think we'll just talk about when we get there. Um, Lyman finally realizes it's a trap. He leaves. Um, he finds Strozzi, Danny, and six men they brought to help him. He tells them it's a trap and they've just stepped into it. Um, they do this whole escape sequence where everyone escapes, but Lyman goes back for Rene Jorda um, and he finds that she has been killed and he is captured. Yes. Call oh, Rene. We only knew you for so long. Yes. Mm. Um. I think it's interesting here because it, it, we start right in the first paragraph with um, the extraordinary degree of self-control in public and in private uh, through the years have become second nature to him. Uh, he made this journey without deviating and without weighing the consequences or indeed anything but the obstacles which lay before him. Um, so I feel like there's a few things like this where at least my interpretation of it is that he is just like, I promise Philippa, I'm just gonna do this. And he's like so laser focused on it that he misses things and makes bad decisions. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's very calculated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or he's not, he's not thinking about the larger picture at all. He's just thinking about like what's immediately in front of him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we get this, one of the longest sequences in his point of view actually. I was going to say, like, I don't think we've ever had a chapter that's just him by himself, like explaining what's going on with him. It's like there's always other people around and their points of view are interspersed. So I was like, this is strange. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a few things I think we can observe through his point of view that are telling. One is when he's thinking about how Sibylla um, had raised him with laughter, with joy, with laughter, with care as her second son, although it appeared dot, 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 it was certain that he was not. A circumstance with which, not being a child, he would come to terms, no doubt, presently. Mm -hmm. So this is his point of view. And I think it's it's funny because like, I think D, you said this about him when we were reading the previous book. Like, you know, you're an adult, get over it. Yeah. Um, and he's telling himself the oh. same thing right, right. like he's not able to do it yeah yeah well also it's interesting that he says although it appeared and then we get an ellipsis of like a pause of thought and then he says it was certain and so it's like he's not actually even completely convinced that 
he thinks there's still a chance that he could be Sibylla's son. Um, he's just telling himself that he's not. So I think that's also another, another clue. It's like he's trying to tell himself the worst case scenario and not allow himself to hope for the better case scenario. So yeah, exactly. Um, so this whole scene is so ominous and done it writes it so well it super freaks me out <laughs> the abandoned farm all the details yeah. the smells the, the dried starving dog yeah yeah this this scene actually really reminded me of like when Macbeth is on the heath and meets the three witches for some reason just crazy because he mentions Hecate later in this chapter so that's true um and he has this flashback to the Dom de Dutance's slash Martha's um I have your mind in my palm, I will crush it. Um, which is just like, I love that he flashed back to that because that's so creepy and scary. Mm -hmm. um, and it does feel like he's, like, he's just very mentally unstable throughout these chapters. Yeah. It's also the beginning of his headache coming back. Yeah. That's know? what I was gonna say. We get, we, get, we get a really explicit, some really explicit language about his headaches that I don't think we've had as explicit before from his perspective, so. Well, and I think that we um, we consistently see the headaches happening at times of emotional stress, mm -hmm. um, which is another reason I think he he's so um, focused on the present that he's missing mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I think so. Um, yeah, there's a part where he, um, it's hot by the fire. He sat, um, he moved to a low stool and sat there breathing evenly. It took all his willpower and a good deal of his attention, which is why he was doing it. So he's just focused on his breathing to get through this. He's not, like he's missing all these really obvious signs. Yeah. I don't think he knows it's a trap. I think he's just like trying to. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. It was. Uh, yeah, when you brought all this stuff up, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Her knowing who he was should have been the yeah. only thing that mattered. He should have known right away, like, wait a second, something's weird here. Boys can't be that distinct. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, he does kind of ask at some point, like, how she knew, but like, yeah, he's so, he's so missing it. Mm -hmm. Again, I think he's just, he's just, barely functional and that's why he missed yeah. it. Um, yeah. So let's talk about what's revealed. Okay. So first we get the fact that um, Gavin Crawford is a name to be loathed. She hated him and Leonard Bailey, his kinsman. Um, half the evil in that house came from Bailey and that's why she left Mid Coulter because Gavin and Bailey were so awful. Mm -hmm. Not a surprise. Um, which we, yeah, we knew that. And then why don't you guys talk about the next bits? Cause I already know all of it and you're excited to have learned it. Okay. So one piece of information I think is good is that Mr. X, I'm going to keep calling him that, even though I do think it's Francis, uh, Mr. X bought Sibylla a house in Paris, which we did not know that before. Right. So yeah, I don't think so. Okay, so that's, I think the key is going to fit something in the house in Paris. So they have to find the house in Paris that is Sibylla's that she shared with this man. Um, and I think that's going to be, I hope Philippa figures that. I don't know. I think that would be interesting. Um, Another good piece of information is that the third person who signed those things, Isabel Rosette, is actually still alive. It's Renee's mm -hmm. sister. So even though Renee dies at the end of this chapter, we can still find Isabel and get more information from her. And she's connected to the house. Like she's still taking care of the house. She's paying the bills. She's making sure it's clean and warm and all that. So, so that's like, obviously we have to go to this house in Paris, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, so this, Par so, the, okay. So he brought her a jewel of a house there in Paris. It was where they stayed when he was free and when she could come from Scotland. So that's after she marries Gavin, she's able to come back to France and stay in this house with Mr. X when she can. Hence the birth of Lyman and Eloise makes sense. And Gavin is still alive. 
So. And Gavin is still alive. Right. Okay. So if I go back, I did take notes. It was at the end of chapter five. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So when Sibylla is 27 years old, she leaves the convent in France and marries Gavin, um, who is 20 when they marry. Francis Sr. is 45. <laughs> I figured out all this stuff. Um, so in 15, this is all in 1515. And then in 1516, Richard is born. So that's Scotland. And then in 1524 in France, um, Marta is born to Beatrice, Beatrice, um, and probably Mr. X. So Beatrice and Mr. X have Marta in 1524. In 1526, Francis is born and Beatrice, or Lyman is born and Beatrice dies in 1526. There's an assumption that those things are linked, but they may not be linked. Like she may just die in 1526 and Francis Lyman is born to Sibylla in 1526. Um, and then in 1529, Eloise is born and Francis Sr. dies in the same year in 1526. 1529. Okay, so if Sibylla leaves the convent at 27 to go marry Gavin, she could have met Francis Sr. like at any point before that, because the father, Mr. X, is like met her at the convent and all that. So somehow her relationship with Mr. X started at the convent before she leaves to marry Gavin. So. Possible. Why would she leave him to go back to marry Gavin though? And then okay. it happened for her to come back. So what if what if the scar for the dad, um, Francis Sr., he's got some massive scars. We said some massive injury. So what if, and he's fighting all over France and Italy, right? So what if he's in something in Italy and he gets wounded presumed dead and so she Sibylla thinks he's dead so then but then why in the world would she marry his son who's a horrible horrible person like that's that's the part that I find super fishy like maybe she's in love with Francis senior and thinks he's dead because he's fighting in Italy or something and gets wounded but then why in the world would she leave the convent and marry Gavin who I mean, does he fake out that he's a nice guy or something? Like, you're grieving my dad, come bury me? Like, it seems sketchy. Maybe she wanted the line to continue because she didn't have any children. She didn't have any children. So instead of having children with the man I love, I'm going to have children with his son? It doesn't make much sense, but... Sketchy, like... Yeah. There has to be some reason she married Gavin because clearly it, it's because she hated him. And Richard was born 10 months after she married Gavin. So it's not like she was pregnant with someone's child and then had to get married. Yeah. So well, I think we know for sure that Gavin is Richard's father. Right, 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 right. So, so I think that sort of works on the timeline situation, but I can't figure out how it works like for people's choices. Mm -hmm. Like why in the world would Gavin marry this girl and why in the world would Sibylla marry him? Like neither of those things make sense to me if, if what I'm saying is true. But then we've also got, if Sibylla, well, no, never mind. I think I answered my own question. What was because it? Because Sibylla doesn't come back till a certain point and two years before that, Mr. X and Beatrice have a kid together. Right, so what if Mr. X slash Francis Senior, like who isn't really dead, comes yeah. back to France and like, oh crap, the woman I loved married my son and went to Scotland. Mm. That's a bummer. I'll never go to Scotland. So he stays in France, has some sort of affair with the Dom de Jutance's daughter, which fine, whatever, the love of your life is off in France. You know what? I'm, I'm attributing, by the way, a lot of romance to this Mr. X and Sibylla, which may or may not actually be true. <laughs> it's just me. Um, so he has an affair with Beatrice, Mr. X does, but then Sibylla finds out he's alive and comes to France and he buys her a house. 
like and then they hang out in France as much as they can and she goes like and this is why Gavin is so angry about Francis and or about Lyman and Eloise I guess but then there's also the hitch that gets thrown in that there's a death certificate for Francis Crawford. Is that right, true? The baby? Yes. Did that, is there a baby that actually died, or is that I just forgot about that? I completely a complete forgot. red herring thrown in to make things even more confusing. Oh, I hundred percent forgot about that. Because Lyman now thinks that he is Beatrice's son, and that right, because she dies the same year he's born. Yes. In in that she died in childbirth and that Sibylla no, that was just an assumption Lyman says presumably in childbirth well sure we don't, we don't actually know that for sure she could have just like whacked her head on something and died sure um so we have a baby he's death assuming. Certificate. oh that's right I completely forgot about the death certificate Ugh. that just muddles things it, I mean it's still entirely possible to fit into that theory but yeah. But then where do we have, whose dead baby do we have? I don't know. If there even is a dead baby. I, I, know, I don't know if I trust this death certificate at all. Oh, that's true. Maybe they, maybe Sibylla had Lyman and they were going to pretend that he died at birth. He was stillborn or something, but then decided not to later. Or maybe the death certificate that he found was actually Beatrice and Beatrice had a son named Francis Crawford because Francis Crawford was the father and that son died. And then our Francis Crawford, Lyman, is still Sibylla's Francis Crawford. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? That it could be possible. <laughs> I'm sure it'll explain it eventually. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Okay. And again, <laughs> it could be that like Sibylla's having an affair with, I don't know, the De Guise guy or something <laughs> like oh. is he is he old enough I don't know like I guess he's one he would the, be old enough one of those De Guises is named Francis oh really oh no why did you tell us that crap okay wait <laughs> oh no that's interesting hmm is it the what is it the Duke De Guise that's that's Lyman's rival right now no, that's Charles de Guise, I think. Oh, because that would be interesting. Oh my gosh. If if like the guy that they're rivals right now actually ends up being his father. That would mean he'd be related to the Queen Dowager and Mary Queen of Scots. Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh God. That's a whole wrinkle that's interesting. Um it is Francis the Duke de Guise. Charles is the Cardinal. Oh, okay. So the Duke, that's the number two guy that breaks his rivals, that Duke that we're talking about right now, his name is Francis. Stop naming your children Francis. Right, this is confusing, too many but Francis, I like it. Too many Marys, too many Catherines. Okay, I kind of like this. This could be interesting if there's like a big father son because i think that would be interesting for the book because if his father is i mean gavin's dead francis the first is dead so lyman can't have a showdown with his father like he can't have a big like scene where they meet and have you know some sort of big hashing everything out so if his father's still alive and it's this guy do we have any indication that he was hanging around France when Sibylla was in a convent. Well, he's French. He's French. So, yeah. Does Francis de Guise have any other children? Because Lyman cannot meet his brother, remember? Oh, right. Good point. Good point. Well, according to the prophecy, there's no actual thing that says the prophecy has to happen. But yeah. I think it would scan well if it does actually ring true. Because yeah. we were assuming you shall never again meet your brother was Gavin. Right. If Francis the first right. is his father. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, I wonder if he has like a dead son or something. Okay, keep we're, we're keeping our eye out. For now, any information about this guy. That would be cool because it would make Lyman a blood relative of Mary Queen of Scots, also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would. Uh -huh. 
so th I'm surprised you didn't mention this, but um, there's a line that Renee says, um, they called it Francis, she would have no other name. Yeah. So the name is important. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have Lyman telling her, so again, this sort of, I think he genuinely believes it or has convinced himself or is trying to convince himself to protect himself that um, mm -hmm. uh, it seems likely that the baby you saw in Paris died just after birth. I have seen the death certificate. Um, then she adopted me as her son and brought me up um, by the same name. And he says, it makes no difference. LOL. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure, it doesn't. Um, there's only one thing none of us knows. Uh, we do not know the name of the father of the baby, but you did. And then she says, of course, I knew him. He came to see her in the convent. That, you know, was how they met. His house was nearby. A uh, pretty, pretty big pair they made. So he's handsome, whoever he was. Um, and and then she says, so then she says, then you are Beatrice's child by the same father. But I think she means Marta would be Beatrice's child by the same father or the dead baby that got switched or something. Yeah, or Beatrice had another child. Here's, here's something. She keeps saying, but with the same name. So is she talking about the baby that died or is she talking about the father because for francis crawford francis crawford they'd have the same name well then she tells him the name she says but then she spoke in the same flat querulous voice the name he had borne in his mind like a slave brand through most of the long solitary years of his life which so would also be his name his name francis right. crawford. which would be so that would i mean so then it's telling us that francis crawford is the dad um he says, but it, it was of no importance. Birth did not matter. Hereditary, heredity was merely a hurdle. One was what one made of oneself, that and no other. Ask one more question and there would be nothing left to ask ever that mattered to him, but he did not ask it. So then it's like, oh, what's the question? Who's my father? But if she just told him that. I know. Then there's another question. Yeah, what's that question? Ah. <sighs> I don't know, like, is he legitimate? Is there, I don't know. Um, yeah, birth did not matter. Heredity was merely a hurdle. Ask one more question. There'd be nothing less left to ask. Were they, maybe like, were they married would be the question, which would, that would have huge implications legally if Sibylla was married to his father, to, okay. If Sibylla was married to Francis before he had some sort of mysterious injury, whatever that was that gave him the scar, if she presumes he's dead, then marries Gavin for what idiotic reason I can't imagine. That's so dumb. Why, why would she do that? Um, then marries Gavin if Francis Sr. isn't dead, then her marriage to Gavin would be bigamous, like illegal. Which brings me back to my theory from like book two, which is Francis is the real heir, heir and Richard is not because if her marriage to Gavin is not legal, then Richard isn't really the heir of Crawford, but Francis is if he's the oldest son. Well, no, no, wait, Gavin would still be the son. Gavin was, he's older. But if he dies, if Gavin dies, no. Well, once he dies, then Francis would be the next. Right. Because then technically Richard wouldn't be legitimate. Right. So it would go to his younger brother who would be Francis. Yeah. He would be Lyman because Richard isn't legitimate. So then Lyman is really the heir of mid culture, which I've, which I've been saying all along, I think it would be super interesting, although it didn't work out the way I thought it would, but, but it would be super not interesting, like this moral quandary, if Richard is not actually the person who's supposed to be running mid culture, but Lyman is, but that's Richard's entire identity. And Lyman really does love his brother. So if- I'm gonna take that. 
he's not going to take it right so if if he finds out some information that leads to that conclusion i don't think he's going to tell anybody or i don't think he's going to let people know he might tell sibylla that he knows or whatever but I can't imagine him coming to mid culture and saying like, get out, I'm in charge. <laughs> like, I just, I just can't see that happening. No, all. he loves his brother too much for yeah. that. Yeah. And like you said, that's like the capstone of Richard's existence. Is yeah, his entire master. identity. Yeah. And well, apparently he's yeah. really good at it too. Like yeah. he's practical and he cares about the pigs and the, you know, like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the, yeah. What's his wife's name? Yeah. Marietta, yeah. And like she's all like they're all they have kids and it's I just can't maybe, see. It. Maybe that's the question that he didn't ask Renee Jorda. Maybe it was, am I the true heir of midculture? Yeah. Like if because if Sibylla married. Well, I don't know. If Sibylla married if if it's Francis de Guise is his dad, then that's another like then if Sibylla married him that opens a whole nother can of worms true because if she spoke the name she didn't necessarily say the last name she may have just said francis in which case it could be either francis interesting yeah i think she said francis crawford though i do too yeah. I, do. I think that that is much more interesting than the de Guise thing also i think I just can't think of like, why does he keep coming up? Like he's long dead. He's not part of the story, but he keeps coming up at random in random conversations throughout all these books. He's been mentioned a few times, it seems like in each book. So yeah, I think, I think it's him. Just kept his spirit alive for us, for the readers. He keeps just kind of like reminding us a little bit like, oh, this guy exists, this guy exists, he was a thing, you know, and, and as we found out more information about him, like, he seemed to have a mortal injury that caused a scar, he was in France and Italy the whole time, you know, I just, yeah. anyway, okay, so those are our speculations, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see if we're right. So when Lyman makes the he has this mental thought. Well, obviously it's a mental thought. He has a thought. <laughs> um, a thought. It was of no importance. Birth did not matter. Heredity was merely a hurdle. One was what one made of oneself, that and no other. Does he, like, what's actually going on there? Because it's, it's a really interesting, um, is this true? Does he believe it's true? Does he believe it's true intellectually? Does he believe it's true emotionally? Um, and it's really interesting in how it parallels the situation with Kazum and Kairadin. Yeah, I feel like this is a little bit of him trying to convince himself of something because I think he's trying so hard not to care about this information, but he does care about it a lot. And this is the phrase actually that made me wonder if the name but it says like it's the name that had borne in his mind like a slave brand through most of the long solitary years of his life. So what name has kept him enslaved his whole life? His own name? Like, well, he hardly ever uses Francis. He goes by Lyman. He only lets people that are very close to him actually call him Francis. But why would that name have tormented yeah. him his whole life? Yeah, why, why, is it because his, because Gavin treated him so bad because of his name? Was there something about his name that when he was a child, it was? I mean, if Gavin knows that his real father is Francis Crawford I, it's not just knowing that it wasn't his son. If he knows the truth about who Lyman's real father is, that would cause him, I think, to be even more hateful towards him. And I think we think, I think that Gavin knew, like that was the motivation behind him treating Lyman so terribly, was that he knew the truth of who he was and where he came from and all that. So, yeah. Well, I think also if we think about Lyman bearing throughout his life, um, remember when Robin Stewart said something that implied Lyman was a bastard and Lyman just like lost it and punched him out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is like 
a hint that he has throughout his whole life had this fear that he's mm -hmm. a bastard. And then from what you guys are saying, maybe it's a fear that he's an incest bastard, you know, um, that is like part of why he reacts so badly uh, to that, uh, you know, and have anyone pokes at it. Mm -hmm. Which actually would make sense if that would make that question ask one more question and there'd be nothing left to ask ever that mattered to him. That would make the were they married question, like that would make that the question, right? Because if it if it's am I a bastard is the is the thing that has haunted him his whole life and that he has this emotional response to when anybody mentions it, then that would be the key question, like am I am I legitimate or am I illegitimate? Well, and I think it's interesting because he keeps telling himself it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, which mm -hmm. right, it doesn't matter. But right. um, but I guess it does matter. Especially <laughs> when you grow up feeling like you don't belong in your family, you can't just mm -hmm. flip a switch and have it not matter to you. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, um. So I guess going back to this, the, the scene here, um, I also love how, she, I, I just love the whole, whole way this whole sequence is written because it's so ominous and, and so eerie. Um, and the way that when he realizes finally <laughs> catches on that he's in a trap um, and he's like, you knew my name, were you expecting me? Um, and we had a moment before where the fire made her look young and he could see her as she'd been um, when she was younger with Sibylla. But now um, she sat very still and now the fire did not renew the illusion of youth, but lit without pity, the blank face of age and fatigue and helpless futility. Um, and she says, they said they would kill me if I warned you. So this um, just creepy moment of discovery of like, I'm in a trap. I've been in a trap this whole time. Um, and he, he, the way he also thinks about her, it's not her fault. And then we find out later that he has spent this whole sequence where they figure out an escape and he helps his men and, and, uh, get out. He spent the whole time just worrying about this old lady and thinking about how all the noise and the smoke and how scary it must be for her. Um, and this, like, this is why I think it's so interesting that every time we get in Lyman's point of view, we see this version of him that's so empathetic and, and caring that he doesn't show the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that he, you know, he's so worried about her, he gets back to her and then he has he finds her dead and he has this like PTSD flashback to Una. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was so sad. <sighs> yeah. Um, I, I do also, I like the way when he's got this plan, I mean, he has this elaborate plan to escape with the fire in the barn and the pigeons and blah, blah, blah. But um, I love the way that it's, where is it? They. Strazi and Danny tell the men that like, or Danny tells the men that Strazi and Lyman are more dangerous to them than the Spaniards or something and that they have to do exactly what they say. And so they're catching pigeons. And like, you can just see these guys going like, why are we doing this? Like, this makes no sense. And yeah, it's part of the plan. And yeah. yeah just do what they tell you. Don't ask. Do it, just do what they tell you. Um, Go catch pigeons. Yeah, just continuing to build on the ominous nature of the of the scene, because um, we switch point of view, finally, we get in Danny's a bit. Um, Lyman says, did you track me here? Yes, said Danny. The hair moved on his scalp at the tone of the question. Um, and then later, Danny had never seen Lyman so totally devoid of all that could be called human emotion. It's just this like, Lyman is scaring Danny a little bit with how intense he is being. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was obvious, like the whole like fake out in the barn with the bit about like, it was not clear whether it was Julian or Diego, whose jubilant voice finally reporting, shouting that the prisoner was a dude. I'm like, it's Lyman. <laughs> I love how it's done. It doesn't even bother to explain that it's all uh, mm. an act. Like she knows by now that you right. caught we on. Speak. That we know. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it definitely wasn't Julian or Diego, it was definitely Lyman. <laughs> It's like, and how there's like probably only one person in the barn attic and the rest of them are like hiding and waiting until like they all go up to actually yeah, yeah, yeah. the ambush. Yeah, it's yeah. all like picking them off one by one. 
all subterfuge. Mm -hmm. And then Lyman goes back for he had one responsibility, which he could, in fairness, ask no one to share with him. Mm -hmm. So he goes back to save Renee, mm -hmm. um, knowing the risk to himself, but not wanting any of the men to be risked. Yeah. And I mean, you could easily be like, she betrayed him. Why is he going back to save her? But mm -hmm. of course, he is a compassionate and empathetic person. Is like she was in an impossible situation. Yeah, there's no way she could have. Yeah. She's a blind old woman who can't really do much for herself. I don't think she had any choice in this matter. I mean, the only thing she could have done was told him before the fires, before he lit the fire. And then, but how would she trust that? Yeah. Anything. Yeah, I mean, because they said, I mean, the Spanish officer said, he's come to kill you, light a fire, and we'll come save you. Right. You know. Yeah. She still thought she was going. He was there to kill her until it was too late. So. Yeah. He would have gotten away if he didn't go back for her, but yeah. I'm glad he got captured because the next chapter is fun, too. Yeah. All right, should we go to the next chapter? Sure. Lord Grey. Austin. And oh, Austin. Austin. Oh, Austin. Oh, my pretty sweet summer child, Austin. Mm. Is he though? Not really, but. I actually, I have some sympathy. I think she's setting Austin up to be like legitimately sympathetic in this chapter. Like he's been kind of an idiot up to now and he's still an idiot in the chapter, but he's more like an honorable, like his idiocy is based in his extreme sense of honor and, and ethics. And so I think sort of like Catherine became more interesting a couple of chapters ago because she cared about her mother and she did this adventure and she went and drag, you know, and, and like, so it's like, hey, this girl seems kind of cool. It's like Austin kind of gets a little redeemed in this chapter and you're kind of like, okay, he's a decent guy. And I feel like Dunnett is kind of setting both of them up so that the reader feels like, okay, they are actually legitimate rivals like Austin would be okay for Philippa and Catherine would be okay for Lyman even though of course we're like never <laughs> no way but I do think if if they didn't if there wasn't some of this like we would never even entertain Austin as a option for Philippa because he was such like this callow youth that was just ridiculously immature hello <laughs> I was wondering where the kitties were hello kitty just ignore uh, them. They keep going as if <laughs> <laughs> we can't ignore the cats. Um, so I liked I liked that it this made Austin more sympathetic and at least a little bit more legitimate as a rival, even though he's really not. <laughs> All right. So um, we'll quickly summarize uh, what happens here. Um, so we have Lyman is brought to the fortress of Ham. I don't know how you actually say this, um, where he, uh, we kind of learned that he was very upset, of course, about Rene Giordo's death and, and fought back and got beaten up himself. Um, so he's all, he's all uh, battered. Um, and he meets up with Lord Grey after so many years, another blast from the past. Um, and they have this whole exchange, which ends with Lyman agreeing to give Grey all the inside info about France's war strategy in exchange for Gray helping to send him back to Russia. Um, and then we cut to Lyman's men discussing how to save him. Um, and this is where we have the sequence where Danny accuses Archie of being a traitor who has sold Lyman out. And Archie then turns it back on them and says, well, you're all terrible friends because none of you even noticed that Lyman has been trying to kill himself. And I've been the only one on suicide watch this whole time. <laughs> Yay, Archie. Oh. Um, and then we have, I think, very significantly, we can talk about this, we cut to Lyman acting like a complete pig to Austin Gray, um, which comes right after the Lyman is suicidal revelation because it's pretty clear Lyman is trying to get Austin to kill him. Right. Um, and then the men rescue Lyman um, and he's angry about it because he had this whole plan about getting tortured and revealing information that would be beneficial to France in the end. Um, so yeah, not, not so grateful about being rescued. Um, and, and 
very, uh, all of his plans are either get killed right now or get tortured <laughs> and then get like, yeah, not, not, so, not good plans, not so emotionally healthy right now. No. Mm. Okay. I did like, there was a, I, I don't think I wrote it down, but there was a slight reference that Gray made to Lyman's Spanish that I thought was funny. Oh yeah, it's on 222. Um, having reconsidered a tart comment about overplaying one's hand in pretty Spanish masquerades. Masquerades, right, right. Nice throwback to Game of Kings. But I, I super love, I actually really love their relationship here where um, it's not a playful, it's not a joke. It's Gray is, is actually, Lyman takes him seriously. He's a genuine threat and he takes Lyman seriously. And like, there's a moment where Gray thinks there was a certain relief in doing business with professionals. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like, like, I like how Gray it isn't driven by the grudge. He has a legit reason to be totally driven by a grudge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. They're both sort of masterminds of what they do, and yeah, and professionals. They're both professional. Yeah. So who's the traitor? Do we know? I mean, obviously you know Laura, but well, Lyman says I know the handwriting. Yeah. Who's the handwriting is he gonna know who? Yeah. Who's, who's the handwriting before? Right. Well, the people that were around when he and Philippa had the discussion about Rene Jorda were Philippa himself and really nobody else. They were at Mary Queen of Scots' house. So it could have been one well, of the- Mr. Sort of, was there. Yeah, but they were in another funny. room. I know, I thought, I thought they were in the same room. Lyman and Philippa went to like another room to talk about this stuff. Oh. So, I think they were alone in the room, but really anybody in that house could have overheard if they were spying. Mm -hmm. So Mary Fleming, Mary Queen of Scots, any of the servants. I don't think Archie was there. I don't think any of the um, St. Mary's men were there. But Archie said he knew later. Yes. And, like there was a couple of people that found out later. So whose handwriting would Lyman know? Well, he'd know Philippa's, but that's ridiculous. Like, um, I mean, unless she wrote to her mother or something and it got intercepted. I don't know. How do they know about Rene Jorda to begin with? I mean, would Sibylla had written, have written her? Like, so who knows about Rene Jordan? Well, Sibylla how, does. How do Lyman and Philippa know about Rene Jorda? Because of Leonard Bailey. Oh. But how would Leonard Bailey know that he was going there to meet Rene Jorda unless this just happened a while ago? Maybe Leonard Bailey just said months ago, like, hey, keep your eye on this old lady because Lyman might go there. Which means they had to have been watching her for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, was it Leonard Bailey? Really I hate him. So terrible. Oh, he said he'd just go away. Well, that makes it much better than any one of his men, because I was hoping that nobody was being a traitor. Like, I trust everybody around Lyman. For the first time in six books, I trust everyone around Lyman. Yeah. Would he know Leonard Bailey's handwriting? How does he know? Yeah, because Leonard Ray Bailey wrote him a letter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, remember when he was originally implicated in Scotland? Oh. oh, oh yeah. But Leonard Bailey is a forger, so it could be anyone's hand. Yeah. Right. Oh, that. So that's interesting. What if Leonard Bailey? What if the handwriting that Lyman recognizes in the hand in the note is not actually Leonard Bailey? Like, what if it's Philippa's handwriting, but it's actually Leonard Bailey that sent the note? Mm. The plot thickens. He wouldn't think that of her, though, would he? I hope not. It's mm. just timing wise because they literally just had this discussion, him and Philippa in secret, and then yeah. this letter got sent. But yeah. that would mean that he's in France. And the last time we saw him, he was in England. Larry Bailey? He couldn't send the letter from England? 
Well, because the letter says that he'll be in the woods to collect the money, which also really sounds like Leonard Bailey. He's doing it sort of for monetary purposes. But that would mean he either had to send somebody to collect the money or he would have to be there in France himself. Hmm. And I think he's still in England. I mean, that he could be in France, in which case I'm sure we'll run into him eventually. But he's kind of lazy and homebound. Like he's yeah. in the library with all his books and doesn't read them. And <laughs> um, hmm, interesting. Hmm. Well, I hope it is him because, like I said, I don't want it to be anybody else that I. Know. I like. I like that. It, that it's him. That's true. That's. That's good. Uh, so through this whole sequence, we have reason to kind of doubt Lyman for one of, I mean, not actually one of the first times we've had many reasons to doubt Lyman, recently, <laughs> but not recently because we kind of caught on that he's a good guy. Um, but um, I do think it's telling that like the first thing that opens this is Lyman is still just so angry about the death of Rene Jorda. And the first thing he does is make sure that the captain who got her killed is going to be punished. And Gray, like, he's a professional. He agrees. He's like, yeah, sure. It doesn't mean anything to me to, like, ruin this captain's life. Yeah. yeah he would step the bounds. There's no need to kill the woman. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love that Lyman cares so much and is like, mm -hmm. this guy out. Um, he can't hurt any more innocent old women. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he already has six inches of steel in him, so yeah, he's not it, doing it, so it, well it, as it is. Yeah. Um, so I think also we have the threats that Gray makes and the big threat is to um, basically ransom Lyman for a sum of money that would mean bankrupting not only Lyman but also Philippa and Richard. Um, and of course we can tell that Lyman is horrified by it and it is interesting that he says even for me the price is too high because he was ready to give up anything to go back to Russia but he wouldn't go back to Russia at the cost of bankrupting everyone he cares about. Right. Right. And then the other option is to go back to Spain or be taken to Spain with the king or something. And then we have option number three. Option three, sell out uh, the French. Yeah. All the info. Um, Lyman says, I have my eye on a piece of ground called Al Sadama, you have found the right coin. I accept it. Um, D, you may know what that is. I Googled it. It is a graveyard that Judas, that was bought with the coin that Judas was given for betraying Jesus. Oh, I did not know that. And there's another reference to Judas later, like a Judas gate or something. So this whole thing is like strewn with these Judas references of like, yeah. Lyman, is he a traitor? Like, Judas? Yeah. yeah, no. I mean, I think the only thing that makes it plausible, even slightly plausible, is that he is working for France under duress. And so if he wasn't working for France under duress, there's no way this would be believable. But it is slightly like you're, I'm, I was sort of reading it going, no, surely he's not. And like, well, maybe he is. And like, no, surely he's not. And so. I mean, it was interesting because when I was reading it, I was like, I don't really care if he is. Like, the French have been horrible to him. If he is betraying them, I mean, they forced him to yeah. go there. He has wanted just to go to Russia the whole time. Like, I wouldn't hold it against him. Yeah. But at the same time, it's such a dishonorable thing to do to betray the people you've been spending your time with and, and right. helping. And his own men. Like, that's the other thing. It's like, I didn't think that he would betray, like, Adam and Danny and yeah. Like even if he's mad at them, he's still like, even though he fired him, like he let them stay with him and everything. So I don't think, I didn't think that he would do that to them. I wasn't worried here. I thought there was no way he was doing it. But then later when he's talking to Austin and he's like, oh, I told your uncle all about Calais. I was like, wait a second, that actually is the plan. It, did he really tell them that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the first time I read it, I was like, what? I was like, wait a second, no. But he's giving so them false plan, information. Is his plan to tell them about Calais and then under torture say, no, it was this other place. And then they go to the other place, but he didn't yeah. get to the torture part. Exactly. And all That's all so the funny. information he gave about Calais was false anyway. And it like, yeah. he's like, oh, we're going to do this. And then like, when they looked at plans as Calais, they're like, oh, but that building's not where he said it was. And like, a lot of these details don't add up. So he's make he's 
misdirecting them by telling them basically the truth. I love that. It's great, but it's very risky. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. uh, if, if Gray wasn't so uh, perceptive, a, a, a dumber commander basically might have fallen for it. Mm -hmm. He's got to be he's got to be subtle about his or a dumber commander wouldn't have fallen for it. <laughs> like like the dumber commander wouldn't have noticed the flaws. Right. And would have thought yeah. the plan really was to attack. Hillary. Right. But Gray falls for it because he notices the flaws. And so he thinks it's fake. Yes. Oh, poor Greg. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so we have a brief sequence where we see the Duke de Guise's um, uh, manipulations against Lyman. It's like it's like three par four paragraphs mm -hmm. on two twenty seven, um, where we hear about his magnificent plan for the recovery of Calais. Yeah, his this. plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the and the um, the king, King Henri, saying. Um, you know, we were thinking about going and rescuing Lyman, but the Duke de Guise says it's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and Strozzi's like, well, you know, if the Duke de Guise would reconsider, I'll go rescue him right now. And the mm -hmm. king's like, no. no so the Duke de Guise has basically manipulated things against Lyman. Uh, yeah. And the king's like, oh, we'll get him back at the end of the war. <laughs> yeah. Also, we have um, Archie calling the Duke de Guise Daddy Clutes. Yeah. <laughs> don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy Coots. 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 I don't know. Oh, and we have the explanation in like one sentence of why Adam is back. Um, he tried civilian life with the merchants in London and had found that this band of men provided him with something he could not yet do without. He just needs his friends. <laughs> he needs um, a companionship. And then I also, I enjoyed Danny's like his his um everything's like kind of technically accurate but totally wrong interpretation of Archie, which is how we get like people like Will Scott and Jarrett perceiving Lyman wrong, where mm -hmm. um Danny's perception of Archie is that Archie had supplied him with opium, trained his wife, brought his bastard back home to Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, and of course everyone who was there is like the the context around that is very different than what you're thinking. Right. Because right. Danny wasn't there. Yeah. And he didn't know, he didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And then uh, I love, um, I love the Adam and Jarrett stuff where like Jar Jarrett is being Jarrett and he keeps like getting up to fight Danny and yeah. Adam's like, calm down, Jarrett, let him talk. Right. Nobody's wrong, but like there's something going on here. And then there's a part at one point where um, we, she doesn't even tell us what Jarrett does. It's just in the dialogue, Adam said, Jarrett, sit down. He's doing it all in good faith. <laughs> yeah. Like, we have to then figure out oh okay Jared got up again <laughs> like he pulled up he got up and like pulled out his knife or something <laughs> and it's just like calm down yeah. I love Adam uh, oh. uh so good so much of this is Jared's good heart wanting to protect Archie you know just and, just, and Adam also just being the voice of reason where he's like at the bottom of 2.30, he's just like, that's ridiculous. Adam said sharply, you misinterpreted something you saw. And like, which of course is true. Um, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> Danny was on to something and it is his yeah. observation, even though he interpreted it wrong, that leads to the reveal. If Danny hadn't brought this up, Archie wouldn't have told them. Yeah. Wasn't there something in that chapter where Lyman sneaks out as a monk and Archie follows him where they felt they were being watched or something. Because Maybe. they were being watched and he was watching them. But I think, I feel like there was something we commented on, like what, what's going yeah. on here? But I forget. There was a watcher that we never figured out who it was. I don't know if there was, but there, there's definitely something suspicious about that sequence that I still don't entirely understand if it was, Lyman was having a headache, if, Archie was looking like Archie must have been following him to try to look out for him because he was recognizing symptoms or signals. Mm -hmm. um, I've read some debate with Lyman thinking about like jumping off the hill. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Whatever he was doing, it was obviously eminent because Archie stopped him by bashing his head at the rock. So, which seems like a dramatic thing to do. So. Well, that's a different, yeah, that's not the hill, that's right. the, the night, but yeah. Yeah, it's a different. The night, um, so if you go back and read the sequence um, where Lyman 
everything around where Lyman tries to kill himself, you can see some of the details like there's an earlier part during the chase sequence where I think Lyman, one of them throws a rock at the custom house and breaks the glass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so then when you trace later where Lyman goes, he goes to where he knows the broken glass is because of the chase sequence. Oh. And that's what he grabs and uses to cut his wrists. Oh. And that's the night, it's the same night, yeah, that he and Philippa have that awesome sort of chase sequence. Yeah, yeah. So after that amazing chase sequence with all that adrenaline and the joy of him, mm -hmm. he tries to kill himself right afterwards. And figuring out that Philippa's in love with him or something, then he tries to kill himself. Yeah. Well, and there's a question there. Is it, I mean, it's probably both things together, but it's realizing Philippa's in love with him, but it's also the, the birth certificate, the death certificate of Francis Crawford. That's what Archie finds covered in blood. Mm -hmm. So this, when I read it the first time, I thought he tried to kill himself. I'm surprised you guys didn't pick up on that. No. Because the paper covered in blood, I was like, yeah. why would it be covered in blood? Yeah, I was confused by the blood, but I wasn't thinking that he was suicidal. Yeah, I just thought it was like a fight or something. Yeah. I was hoping that he was past that. Yeah. Oh, uh, Lyman, he's got some issues. Yeah. But I think, I mean, if you think about like, he was very actively suicidal right after Kyredin died. And he mm -hmm. promised he wouldn't do it. So then he just shut down. Mm -hmm. But now he's coming out of being shut down because he can't go back to Russia and just freeze himself off. Right. So he's forced to deal with all the stuff that he hasn't really properly dealt with. And so it's all coming back up as if, you know, almost like unprocessed because he just shut mm -hmm. down so much. Yeah. Um, so he's kind of in the same place he was mm -hmm. at the pawn. That makes sense. Yeah, and and um, Philippa didn't like that promise has no end date. <laughs> you know, she didn't she didn't say that. So, yeah. but that's what this surprises me that um she didn't call him out for that, mm -hmm. and it surprises me that he break he's he broke his promise. Yeah, he was just really upset. I guess. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so then we find out Archie is the one who knows, because Archie's a good guy. And Archie's been following him to protect him. And observant. <laughs> and then, well, and then you see when you kind of read all the sequences where Archie and Lyman have talked over the past few chapters, it's mm -hmm. always Archie wants to stay close to Lyman. Archie isn't going to let Lyman go off on his own. It's all stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I hope that's enough for the other men to sort of, well, not the other men, just Danny to stop sort of suspecting him though. Well, and I hope Jared, well, maybe not Jared, he's Mr. Unsubtle, but Adam and Danny are both like now on suicide watch as well. <laughs> One of them, I think it's Adam, maybe it was Jared, makes comments about uh, Lyman's wrists at the end of this chapter. It's like, oh, those, the, the way they tied you up has really done a number on your wrists. It's like, no, you know, he tried to slash them. Yeah. It's like, you're aware of that knowledge now. Yeah. Jarrett's going to be a bull in a china shop. <laughs> with this information, I feel like, I feel like Jarrett is going to like do something really dumb or make some, make some comment to Lyman about like, you're not going to kill yourself, right? You know, or something like that. Because he just, what? Uh, yeah, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how bad it'll be. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I like, so when we get into um, Austin's point of view here, and I like how Austin's point of view, he thinks of Lyman as Philippa's husband. Yeah. <laughs> All of Austin, Philippa's husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also like this bit about him where it says, um, Austin Gray, a, a gentle man whose youth disguised as yet a steadfastness which no one so far had had real cause to plumb. And I think, again, that's just a little bit of done it saying like, okay, this guy's a little bit more than we've seen so far. And there's a little bit more to him. He's not quite the idiot that we've seen. And it just makes him more, it makes him more a legitimate rival, which I think is good. Although it's interesting that no one has yet plumbed it. So you don't know 
what the outcome would be. You just know that it's there, but you don't know how deep it is. There's steadfastness. Yeah. Um, so Lyman in these scenes is acting really <sighs> terrible. Terrible. Yeah. He's horrible. He's horrible, but he does know exactly how to push yeah. Austin's buttons. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So yeah, I'm curious, like, did how, what did you how, what did you pick up on in terms of like what Lyman is doing and why? Oh, he's hundred percent trying to go to Austin and killing him. Like that that was my thought. Like and and at the end of the scene, he's super disappointed. Like he just he says he makes some comment about um where does he say? Uh yeah, he's like, oh Christ. You know, he's just he's so mad. But there's this thing where he calls Austin. Oh no, it's, it's it's in the next scene. He calls him like something about a virgin. Like he makes another attempt, like right before he gets rescued, trying to force Austin to kill him. And he makes some comment about calling him a virgin. That's like super disparaging, but it doesn't work. You bloody virgin, said Lyman, and bringing his eyes up hard and cold, added something further. He said something so bad, done it, couldn't even write it down. Yeah. Um, Austin had only to lean on the sword. He had only to let it follow its course and his honor and Philippa's would be avenged. His uncle's enemy slain, his nation preserved, his heritage vindicated. And Philippa tied forever to this one hated man would be at liberty. And then he doesn't do it because I guess because he doesn't want his, he wants Philippa to come to him without him yeah. having you know, murdered her husband, which is fair. And he's got ethics. Like, I don't think he wants to murder him. Like, I think he thinks that's wrong. So as much as it would benefit him, he doesn't do it, which. Yeah, especially because it's not necessarily a battle. Like the, yeah, this the outright him. murder, this wouldn't yeah. be, there's no, you know, questioning that. And it says he hasn't killed anyone, so. There's another reference somewhere in here to like Austin being in the cockpit. Um, the idea of the cockfight from the beginning of the book as this metaphor for the life Lyman lives and the life that Austin is trying not to get involved in and like sully himself with. Um, oh yeah, tell me your other reason for braving the cockpit or shall I try to guess it, Lyman says to, to Austin. Um, so I think that metaphor is kind of like Austin doesn't want to lower himself to be what he thinks Lyman is, which is this amoral war person. And of course, we just had this whole talk with Strozzi where like Lyman is kind of doing this, but he doesn't actually, his heart is not in it. Mm -hmm. um, and Austin, of course, is completely wrong about Lyman, but he has no reason to know otherwise because Lyman acts so horrible in front of him all the time. He's terrible. Um, and you can just see Austin, like every time Lyman does this, Austin is further enmeshed in this idea of him like rescuing Philippa from this terrible man. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this. Like you could just see Philippa to him is not actually a real person perhaps, but like an, an idea of this idealized woman that he can rescue from this terrible marriage. And like, and you just know if they actually get married, she's gonna, like she'll just completely run roughshod over him. And yeah, but yeah, he's got some growing up to do. Yeah. Um, we also have Austin saying, you know, a clash of doctrine is coming in Scotland, um, talking about the reformed religion versus Catholicism. Um, so I think this is our first reminder that this isn't just a French thing and an English thing, that it's it's going to make a big difference in Scotland. Yeah. Um, so I think Donna is just planting these seeds for uh, this brewing conflict that is coming you know, historically. Yep. And it is so, like, Lyman is so awful. He's so misogynist and he's uh, so terrible. I wonder how Philippa would react if she ever heard the things that he was saying about her in this scene. He would I mean, I, never say it where she could hear it, but. No, yeah, I know, but. Yeah. Like, if she, would she feel it's. No, never mind. I mean, she knows him well enough to have to be able to figure out what's really going on with him yeah tell him, you know that would disappoint her even more because she would realize he's trying to kill himself and breaking his promise so yeah she wouldn't i don't think she would take it seriously as like 
thinking in any way that he believes the terrible things he's saying. Oh. But she would definitely call him out on it and see right through it to what's going on underneath. Yeah. Um, oh, so there's another line here that I thought was interesting. Um, uh, he, Austin, thinking about the life of military valor, um, held up to Austin by his mother since he too was less than 14. Um, the epitome of the life that he despised and disliked and followed because he would not displease his mother and because whatever else it lacked it upheld honor so this idea that austin just like lyman is following mm -hmm. this life into the cockpit that he doesn't actually want to be going into mm -hmm. um, and that he's doing it because you know similar to some of the issues with lyman he's doing it because he wants the approval of his family and he feels like his family in this case it's his mother doesn't love him you know with Lyman it was feeling rejected by Gavin his father mm -hmm. so it's actually interesting kind of a parallel between the two of them that they're both in this life because of childhood issues mm -hmm. and honestly it just makes you think like these are a, just a couple of the people in the story that we get their their perspective on their own their own thoughts on war and it's both like I don't want to be here and so it just makes you wonder like how many what large percentage of the men who are embroiled in this conflict don't want to be there, you know, and just why do we wage war the way we do when, you know. <sighs> anyway. And meanwhile, Adam came back for the camaraderie. Oh, that's true. Mm. But I don't think he came back for the war. I think he came back for the... He came back for the... The, the friends. And the friends, yeah. Guys. Um... So Lyman kind of um, sort of gives Austin an introduction to like the realities of the world. Um, prepare my dear child to receive a revelation. Hom is not a court of love. Piero Strozzi is not a true Christian knight. Neither is the monarch. Modern war is fought by a number of strong sweaty horsemen with constipation who have their eyes on power, on wealth and on glory and who obey the rules just when it pleases them. Mm -hmm. um, so this, again, this whole just, I feel like there's like a whole theme running through this book of a kind of a deconstruction of this idea that war is noble and good and, and the comparison of it to the cockfight and that there's nothing noble about that. It's just the cynicism of like, there is no glory. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So and I, then, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, I love this bit where Lyman's mad because they rescued him <clears throat> and Adam Blacklock you've got to love Adam <laughs> comes in with this like from now on you will kindly remember that a good military tactician requires the support of a team we are your team <laughs> and it's just it's like what I've been saying all along like Lyman keeps trying to do all this stuff solo and it gets messed up because he's trying to do it solo and he needs to do it with his team and he has a team well, I'm glad his plans got messed up because it involves him getting tortured and then possibly killed. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm like, can can Archie and Danny and Adam and Jarrett be your team? Like, can we please do that from now on? That would be great. So yeah, it's sort I mean, it sort of makes sense. Like he wants to protect them because he's lost so many people before. And he just wants to sacrifice himself and risk himself and, and keep them safe. Um but you know it's not working out so well and also just like the, the way that they're like we care about you and we're not going to let you do it on your own you know and maybe if he finally realizes that like abandoning them is not protecting them because they're going to go after him and be in more danger that the way to actually protect them would be to involve them in all his schemes <laughs> so like maybe he'll realize that that would be great like that'd be some character growth i'd like to see <laughs> Maybe even call them by their first names when he does it. Maybe. And I love this bit where he says, like, why? You must have other interests. He's just like, why are you still messing with me? And they're and at Archie's just like, oh Mary Mother, let's go home. He's like, just like, let us get you home. It's so parental. Yeah. He's just like, he doesn't even answer. He's like, whatever. Well, they could they just see that Lyman is being a dick because he's trying to ward them off and protect himself and they're all like we're not gonna let you push us away like this we're we're like not even gonna dignify this with a response you know 
it's not worthy of a response. Let's go. Let's get you home. <laughs> I mean, it goes right back to like how, what was his name? Um, the guy who was the traitor in the last book. Um, who was oh, the, Ludo. Ludo uh, right, Ludo. It goes yeah. right back to Ludo and how Ludo, even while trying to kill Lyman, saw that he was a good person and, and changed his, his loyalty to be to him. Um, mm -hmm. All of these men who have seen the outer shell of Lyman being horrible uh, have also been able to see through to the good person who's underneath. Just like we, when we get into Lyman's point of view and we see the way he thinks with such generosity and empathy for other people can see that he's a good person under it all. Yeah. Ah, good chapters. Um, okay, there's only two other notes I had. One was the note of, we get Gray's point of view for a second. He had not told Austin because the boy he well knew was a milksop. So <laughs> Gray is so disregarding of poor Austin. Hmm. I feel bad for Austin. Um, you kind of wonder, like, with that line about nobody's plumbed the depths of his steadfastness, it's kind of like, well, have you given him a chance to do anything? Like, if you just think he's an idiot and never let him do anything, then he's never going to show you that he can do stuff, so... And you just see this kid has issues because he doesn't yeah. have parental support, doesn't feel like his family loves him. Like, yeah. Very, very similar to Lyman. Is he uh, Gray's son? Or nephew. like a nephew? No, nephew. that's right, nephew. It says that. I don't know why I asked that. I knew there's like an implication that both Austin's father and mother, are like they all kind of think low of him. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's Lyman, like the way that in the first moments the, the force of his fury had turned senselessly toward trying to burst the immutable wire of his bonds and the way he like cuts himself just trying to escape this is the um the whole behavior of Lyman in this whole sequence, which is so extreme because he's in this absolute turmoil and like lashing out in you know really inappropriate ways, but just like the way we get the the indication of just serious like anxiety and depression and PTSD all just boiling yeah. up inside of him. Yeah. Oh, is it gonna come to a head? Are we gonna see like what's gonna happen? Yes, what's gonna happen? What do you think, where do you think this is leading to? Uh, that is a good question. <laughs> okay, gotta go back to Paris because we gotta figure out what's going on with this house and the key. The key that Flippa has in the house. Like, I'm way more interested in the parental stuff than I am in the war stuff. So, like, let's just, like, everybody just go do war or whatever, but let's go to Paris and look at this house. Yeah. Um, it seems like the war part's going to last that much longer because France seems to be, yeah. like, on the real upper hand at the moment. So, Philip has gone back to Spain or something. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem you're right. So, although maybe he went back to Spain for the winter and he's planning on coming back for the spring because there's that whole bit about how nobody does, nobody does war in the winter. So the French are going to surprise everyone by yeah. waging war in the winter, which, yeah. I'm um, going to spend some time with Lyman's family. I want Richard and Sibylla and Marietta and that whole clan back. And I want, I want some family therapy to occur. Yeah. I either want everyone in Scotland to come over to France or everyone in France to go over to Scotland. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least Sibylla. I feel like, I actually feel like Sibylla has to come to France. Like she has to, for the story to work. Like we have to see her perspective on all of this stuff. Like it all, it's, it's all, this entire story is like spinning around her. And she's the one who actually knows everything. So she has to come here. And I feel like it makes more sense for her to come to France because that's where all this stuff is happening. Like, mm -hmm. can we have Sibylla in this house in Paris that she lived with, with Lyman's father? And, you know, like, can, that is the scene that I want to see. There. So I don't know if Richard and Marietta and everybody are going to come, but I think Sibylla has to come here to give us like a satisfactory narrative conclusion to all this. So, yeah. Um, 
but we did get a slight we did get a note that her health is failing so there was a slight comment at some point in one of these chapters about her health failing so. i mean it was already failing back in book five yeah which in her 70s which yeah really old for the 1500s Never. Was trying to get Lyman to stay in Scotland and be like, visit your damn mother. It's like she's not doing well. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, Philippa wrote the letter about that. Kate arranged the meeting. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like it's like Lyman, you you need to deal with this because your mom isn't gonna live forever. Uh -huh. Um, but I do like I like getting his point of view and seeing him also being like. I know I need to grow up and deal with this, but like, just because you know something intellectually doesn't mean you're actually emotionally capable of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. I just realized Sibylla was like 37 or 38 when Lyman was born. Like 37 when Lyman was born and 40 when Eloise was born. It's possible. It's not, it's, yeah. not, not that common, but certainly possible. Yeah. Um, I guess they were in, they were the, the nobles, so they were healthier than the, the common folk. Because like, yeah, the, the you know, the, the li like lifespan at that time was probably around 40. Yeah, right, right. God, I would be dead. I would be long dead. We'd all be dead. <laughs> We'd all be dead. It's fine. Yeah. Um, Unless we were nobles. Yeah, and even then, not. <laughs> not <laughs> um, any final um, thoughts on these chapters or speculations, hopes for what's coming? I'm looking, I am actually, one thing I am looking forward to with the war stuff is the Francis de Guise and Lyman. Like, I hope there's some, hmm. you know, I don't, I want Lyman to kind of, he's gotten a little recognition for how competent he is, but I would kind of like to see him come into his own. Also, where's St. Mary's? I'm so curious about that. Is it the, do we That's still right. have a mercenary band like wandering around somewhere? Like, where are they? Everyone we care about from St. Mary's is either here, here or right. captured. Right. But we I still just have this image of like this band of men like wandering around somewhere. And, like who's leading them? The the band yeah. to become legendary in Europe. Where are they? Somewhere like off in the Czech Republic or something? Like, what's going on? So. Um, now that apparently he's back in the picture, I would like to see some sort of retribution towards, not retribution, that's the wrong word, um, and not revenge either. I want to see Leonard Bailey get his comeuppance. Oh, consequences for Leonard Bailey. That would be nice. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. If that really was him that wrote the note. I want him to like die in abject poverty <laughs> i mean he kind of would have at this point if lyman hadn't kept paying him yeah that's his only real source of income unfortunately well he's got all those books he could sell yeah he doesn't want to do that he doesn't read <laughs> that's where he hides his money not literally in the books the books are his money uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing where it's going. These last these chapters have been really both entertaining and informative. It's been good. I think we will finish out section two next time. So I'm interested to see if there's any like big revelations or cliffhangers at the end of this little section. Yeah. But there's three more sections after that. So who knows? It's a long book. It is. We're not even halfway through it yet. And yep all right well thank you everyone for watching and commenting we appreciate it bye 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 yeah